one. Right, welcome to the Fit and Fabulous podcast with myself, Greg Farron, and my co-host. Gillian Davis, how are you doing, everyone? We've so got- today, we have got some really great guests on the show today. So I'm going to quickly get into it, guys. We've got Cliff and Marta Wilde, who know <laughs> a whole host of stuff. We're probably talking everything from functional medicine to health to mindset to the whole gamut, guys, huh? I reckon there's a lot. So I'm going to send it over to you, Cliff and Marta Wilde. Thanks for coming in. Thanks for joining us today. Um, and I'd like to kick off with, you know, what, who are you? And <laughs> basically give us a little bit of background about what, where you came from, and how you are doing, what you're doing now. Yeah. So that's I, a big one. I know that's a big one, isn't it? <laughs> we could just like spend what gonna do is, a day talking about it. <laughs> I'm going to start. It'll take me about three minutes to get everything done. And then you can listen to Marta for the rest of the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> so no. Um, yes, we are Cliff and Marta. We run something called uh, the ARA Method, uh, which essentially stands for Awareness, Responsibility and Action. I'm sure we'll talk about it a little bit later. Um, we essentially come from, well, arguably the same place every other human did, but from a point of view of we've been on a journey, Marta's journey was a lot more emotional um, and my journey was a lot more physical. Um, and I've had anything from, uh, you know, being born with a 64 degrees curve of my spine to autoimmune disease, to brain tumor, to meningitis, to yeah, several different things physically, um, to being sitting here symptom medication free for the last 10 years, which is pretty cool. Um, and then Marta's is much more emotional. Like I said, hers was more panic attacks and depression related things, which then in turn had its own knock on to energy issues and fatigue issues. And, you know, Marta lived in the center of London at one point and her commute was like 15 minutes across a very nice part of London and had to stop and had a rest in the middle. So we've both been, I suppose, for our own journeys of not getting the answers we wanted um from the people that we went to and that kind of led us on this journey now of where we've now helped people in 25 different countries um to essentially a find themselves find their place within themselves i suppose is the best way to put it because so many people are you know aware of things and how they can be different but they just don't know how Um, and so our job my job is the physical side of rewiring the human body and Marta's job is the rewiring of the mind. So that's essentially where we come from and what we do. The thing is that I feel every single time we interviewed on a podcast, answer questions about who we are, where we came from, right now, 10 years into this journey together, and obviously several years prior trying to find answers ourselves, it's relatively easy for us to say, oh yeah, Cliff had all these issues physically, I had all these issues emotionally, you know, panic attacks for eight hours straight. That was my peak of performance (laughs) in depression and completely feeling lost with myself and and my life. And right now it is easy to say that, but I want everyone listening to understand that it wasn't always that easy. And that's why I feel us having gone through those personal experiences, first of all, other than anything we've done over and above that in terms of education and looking for answers and finding different methods and methodologies and and processes that we went through that physical experience that we've gone through i feel is really really important for us in terms of our ability to relate to the people that we work with because we work with people mostly that sacrifice their health for success and you know the thing is that we teach people how to live their life what we call unlimited right the unlimited life the whole idea of you know how cliff and marta came together and that's what they they wanted to create for themselves, whatever that means individually for everybody. And like Cliff said, within the concept of the unlimited life, we use the ARA method teaching people to become aware of what the problem is in the first place, what they want to change, take radical responsibility for it, and then follow with action that's suitable for them, that feels good for them, rather than just a cookie cutter plan, or you've got these symptoms, do this or whatever. So it's a very individual journey, very personal journey when people work with us. And bringing together the health and the mind and the emotions and even going as far as energy and this more spiritual aspect 
to us has been the most successful path that we both walked on our personal journey and bringing it to people out there is just every time we go through a challenging spell whether it's in the business or personally we all go through cycles in life right whenever we go through a challenging period on whatever level and in whatever aspect of our lives the fact that we can't not do what we do is what keeps us going and what brings us back into alignment in talking about what we do and working with the people we do because we've not found anyone that talks about both of these aspects health and the mind physical and emotional together on that in that way as we do yeah awesome yeah absolutely <laughs> so and and i think like you say you go through every challenge you go through you probably add something more back into your to the work that you do as well i imagine it's Absolutely. It's a growth phase for you, which is also an, a new education for someone else as well. Like I, think, I think the biggest myth to dispel for people like at the start is to believe that you ever get there. Yeah. Does that make sense? Because mm -hmm. like we as people are always evolving. There's always things that it's like layers of an onion. It's very corny, but it is kind of true. Is that, you know, you, you have a goal and, you know, we can use that analogy as in the distance is like pleasure island. It's the place where we want to get to, right? Everyone chooses a different method to get there, whether it's a jet ski or a wooden raft. Or everyone moves at different paces. <laughs> but inevitably, as you get closer and you get more clarity of what pleasure island is, your brain has this ability to contextualize and make things. Oh, well, hang on a minute. Maybe it could be even better. So all of a sudden, before you realize, you end up at what was your pleasure island a year ago, and you turn up and it's now pain island. Because you've grown and evolved, and because we as humans, we set a lot of unconscious expectations on ourselves a lot of the time. And therefore, we're just constantly in that place of judgment, comparison, judgment, comparison. But in, Mark uses it in an extremely positive way with people, but in a way that doesn't really serve them, it becomes a validation for their stories or their health or whatever it might be, because they're not understanding how to use that in a way that could facilitate them moving forward. Because, you know, in the spiritual realm, they'll be like, oh, we shouldn't judge, there's no judgment. And it's like, well, for you not to live on the street, unconsciously, you have to be making that judgment that that isn't for you. And it's not saying that person there is wrong, but you've made a decision that that isn't where you want to be right now. Mm -hmm. So you're not. And so we're all making judgments, we're all making decisions all the time, but it's just that many of them, well, 90% of them are just subconscious automatic actions to make our life easier. But with what we've grown up with or what we've been exposed to in the modern world, sometimes that doesn't show up in our life the Most way that we prefer. the time, the, the <laughs> easier way is actually not the way that we prefer and this is something for me it's not about the way i work with people it's not about inventing new things it's about allowing people to see where they are and what they have available to them in a different light so for example the judgment and comparison i call it discernment but it's really the same thing the dictionary definition is slightly different but we can't not judge and we cannot compare it because we have to have contrast and the opposite the knowledge of the opposite in life for us to be able to know what we actually want and where we want to go. So we can't, like I always say, we can't know that we're running fast if we haven't walked slow before. So whether it is the pace of our progress in life, whether improvement of our physical symptoms, whether the bank balance, whatever it might be, we have to know different places to be in order for us to then make a decision which place is suitable for us and feels good for us. And, you know, the thing is that it's understanding that there is no good or bad or no right or wrong. There is just good or bad in this moment for that person. And like Cliff was saying, getting to that pleasure island will get there. Something that right now might be a goal destination for us, like I said, a certain health status or a social status or a bank balance or certain mindset it is a goal or a destination that we want to grow and evolve into. And when we get there, our horizon changes. So yes, we got to our original destination, but it's not the final destination. Every single place is a stepping stone for us. And that, embracing that and understanding that and actually enjoying that is something that allows people to live their lives in a lot more of a pleasant and easy way. Because I always say also that our lives are always easy, but what is easy and what comes easy to us is a different story because it could be suffering that comes easy to us based on our stories 
but it could be also thriving that comes easy. But for majority of us, unfortunately, the way we grown up and, and what we've learned it, it's the suffering side that's the the dominant part of our lives but at the same time it is it is a stimulus if someone chooses to do something about their lives becomes aware and then takes responsibility it's a springboard to change springboard to change to action to having different results because if we didn't know that we're not in a place we don't want to be we couldn't possibly want to be somewhere else right so I'm getting all philosophical here, but that's what I have to do and I doing with our guys. It's not giving them a magic formula and a magic prescription for happiness or whatever. It's that radical responsibility that Cliff and I are so passionate about helping people see their lives. Like this morning, I had a client uh, reach out to me and she said, you know what? I've been kind of stewing that within myself, inside me for the last couple of weeks and I didn't want to reach out for help because I felt silly, whatever but I did. And this is what's going on. And I said to her, you know exactly where you are. You've been there before. You know exactly what to do. I'm so happy you reached out. You know now what you need to take responsibility for and where to take it. And within five minutes, that situation was completely turned around and nothing technically changed other than her interpretation of it. Because it's, it's the attitude towards the situation that changes the outcome, right? How she interpreted that. And that's very much, you know, a lot of the time what we do with our guys, obviously, other than testing like Cliff goes deep, deep, deep into their physiology and looking at the human body, you know, <laughs> like I've not really met many people that, that have the ability to look at the human body that way. But that's not even necessary for, for the client to know. There will be people like, Greg, you would probably love geeking out on that stuff, right? Because this is your industry. This is what you do. But for someone like your client, it doesn't necessarily have to be that in depth in terms of what Cliff talks them through if they want to know more they will know more it's down to us to know the nitty-gritty stuff but for a lot of people it's just helping them see it differently change their attitude change their perception of where they find themselves and they just take off from there it's very liberating yeah. Yeah. wow okay I think I've got so many questions now <laughs> Go on, then. <laughs> we could take us a whole down down a whole tangent could it yeah, <laughs> Our speciality. We're, we're gonna come back. This is already an episode two in the making, guys. So, <laughs> so I guess one of my big questions is is on motivation because that's always a big one that comes up with people. Um, people say, "Oh, I'm not motivated. I've got a goal, but I'm not motivated to do it. Um, I can't do it." So I think something that Marta touched on about the identity of obviously in my industry, I can't lose weight. I can't get in shape. So. Just talk to us your, on your thoughts about how motivation really works and what stops people hitting their goals. Who's going to go there? Oh, <laughs> Uh-oh, what well, started? <laughs> we, we can go at two angles, right? So I feel like let's go to the physical angle first, right? Because this is perfect representation. We've just got a new personal client who's literally just joined us and he's tried to talk himself out of it maybe a thousand times. And he just said, in his words, I don't think there's any point me signing up because I have to be the catalyst for this change and I don't think that's inside me. I feel lazy, I feel unmotivated, I feel like it's just not going to work. So what's the point in trying, right? So there's a lot of stories going on from Marta's side there, right? But physiologically, without getting too deep, if you think about it, to help someone be in a position where they're motivated, you have to have a certain level of dopamine, okay, a neurotransmitter, mm -hmm. okay? So this neurotransmitter, for instance, helps you feel motivated and lifts you up. It's a stimulus neurotransmitter, okay? So you have to have very certain precursors. You have to have certain things that your body has, like good vitamin D status, good folate status, all these different funky things that we need in order to make that happen. The problem is you are living in a world now where your attention is being hijacked for everything. So you have something called the dopamine reward system. So every addiction on the planet has been tied to the dopamine reward system. So, and people don't like to think of social media as an addiction, but you know, the definition of addiction, probably the best one is that I've heard is the continued use of something, even though it has adverse consequences. Okay. So like anything, if we look at it then, 
could fall into addiction. And people hate to think that cocaine addiction, for instance, could fall into social media addiction. But the problem is with this is that this pathway, this dopamine reward pathway, is just needing to be stimulate, stimulated. So, you know, people like Facebook and social media channels have whole departments looking at how they can activate that system in your brain. The problem is, is that if you keep stimulating that system over and over and over again, you will imbalance your ability to feel content. So you'll always feel on edge. So to feel content, you need serotonin. So serotonin is, like most people think of it as like the feel good, calm down kind of thing. It's not really. Serotonin is still a stimulator, but it is one that is like you close the door when you get home and you've done well at work or you've had a good day with clients, wherever it might be, and you just feel good. Like you're in a settled place. But the problem is when you keep pushing the dopamine pathway, and people do this even via things like coffee, mm -hmm. because coffee blocks the ability to inhibit dopamine. Mm -hmm. So the problem is, is you keep getting more dopamine and less serotonin. And so you keep getting this very anxious on edge kind of feel and it's got this very short pickup. Mm -hmm. But the problem is, is that you're causing a big stress response in your body because it's tied to many other complex systems which raise stress within the body. So what's happening with people, and this person is very specific like this, is that they are not firing these pathways. And so what we can do is we can say to them, look, I totally get where you are. And if you don't think it's a good fit, don't do it. But have you explored this, 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 and this? If you haven't, there's possibility we can make this work. But if you have, then okay, it's not that thing and everything's cool. And then it's just stories, which is more Mars side. So, I could go a lot, a lot deeper on that, but essentially what I'm saying is for, for people to be motivated and to have get up and go, they need to have very certain biochemical processes working in their body. And nowadays, unfortunately, with social media, with the Western world, with everyone fighting for your attention, what's happening is you're getting a very imbalanced signaling, which is then throwing out many other pathways for that person to ever feel like they're doing enough. They just feel anxious and on edge and just nothing is ever good enough. And the tragic, in a way, part of that is very often people adopt that as thinking that's my personality. Yeah. I'm yeah. just a loser. I'm not motivated. I'm, I'm a shithead. I can't look after myself. But it could seem, simply be blockages in their physiology in those pathways that Cliff was talking about, inhibition of certain things, overuse of others and overstimulation of other aspects. And without people knowing and not many people people talk about it on that level and in that way it could be either a study somewhere that someone like cliff will understand and geek out on and he'll love it or it could be just a you know a, a mention of something somewhere but i genuinely haven't seen a lot of conversations about motivation around the subject of motivation about that actually mm -hmm. um so I feel this is just, this could be an episode on its, on its own. Really. <laughs> We're just talking about motivation from the physiological perspective, right? The way I look at it is looking at the types of motivation. Motivation is only, you guys will know that, obviously a yeah. tiny little particle in the whole greater picture of our journey of self-development, improvement, exploration, right? And majority of people want to move away from pain. So they have that initial motivation that the brain understands okay you're in pain you want to move away from it so what do you want so if someone wants to lose weight we send a signal to the brain that we want to lose weight we want to move away from pain that is extra weight and if we lose half a kilo a couple of kilos to our brain that takes it very literally the job is done that's why people will be super motivated for a week or two maybe a month but then it will dwindle down and they'll be questioning themselves why can i not stick to what i was doing worked so well at the beginning right we don't have a greater picture we don't have a greater purpose other than moving away from pain as humans most of the time so the job of us as coaches people that you know work with people in order to get them from a to b on the path of improvement of whatever area of their lives is very important to understand that motivation away from pain is not necessarily a bad thing it could be a spark bug in someone's journey but it will run out and burn out really quickly so shifting their perception and finding a greater purpose in what they're doing is key here. So when they actually have a greater purpose, like being healthy in their 
retirement, during their retirement or something like that. They might only be in their 30s or 40s right now. But if the greater purpose for them is to be not just lighter, not just look nicer, you know, in the dress on someone's wedding day in two months, whatever, but there is a greater purpose to it, whatever it might be for that person. And that's part of the exploration of, of us and what we do with people and you guys as well in terms of helping them find that greater purpose, what it actually is, because it will be good for everybody. Mm -hmm. But because of what Cliff was talking about physiologically and the stimulation of the pain receptors and pathways in our body by social media, news, governments, politics, everything around us in the Western world, we're not even used to that awareness that it could be something different. There could be a greater purpose to what we do. So helping our clients to explore that and see it shifts that motivation from away from pain to towards pleasure or something greater than, than they originally anticipated. And looking at their stories as well in terms of what they grew up with. And again, like with Cliff's physiology rabbit hole, this could be my more of a mindset, an emotional rabbit hole where if someone's, let's use an overweight person as an example, they want to lose weight and the first thing will be moving away from pain, right? They will lose a little bit of weight. Very often the motivation will um, dwindle down and, and burn out and kind of disappear into the thin air. So we're helping them find a greater purpose, right? But if we don't look at their stories, what being overweight actually means to them, still, even that motivation towards a greater purpose is never going to take them the whole way. Because if someone, for example, grew up in a family of overweight people, grandparents, parents, siblings, everyone was overweight, and deep down they tell themselves a story that I just can't lose weight because everyone in my family has always been overweight, they have to fit in within that tribe, within that community of their family. And by losing weight and being toned and slim and lean, that doesn't fit in to that family values and values, unconscious, unconscious yeah. values, yeah. right? Because that's yeah. initially is not going to be conscious thing. So helping people explore as to really why deep down they believe they have to be overweight because there will be a connection always, every time if someone is in a certain situation, be it in debt, be it overweight, having a disease, whatever it might be, where they don't want to be anymore, but they're there right now, there's going to be a story of some sort that this is a place for them to be at this moment in time. So going a little bit deeper, exploring that and being able to navigate them down the path of self-exploration and going, okay, I might be overweight. I don't like that, but I'm going to explore curiously rather than belittling themselves, invalidating themselves, feeling horrible. That's the usual path, right? We can't uncover those stories there because when we're being horrible to ourselves, when we continue to put ourselves down, we're going to shut down any road down to, to our subconscious because we just want to protect ourselves and our identity. So it's just knowing that if we are in a certain place in our life with whatever issue it is that we're facing that we want to change, there will be a reason why we're there in the first place. So then it's finding for that person that we use an example of fitting in with their family of everyone being overweight is finding a different connection to their tribe, to their family, to their community, that they don't have to connect and fit in to that environment based on their body weight, for example. And that's where the fun begins because being able to show someone how to do it and allow them to, we always just hold the flashlight. That's what we always say. The person takes the steps. So to be able to do that, it's just, I'm just getting tingles and chills. <laughs> that's the most rewarding thing to, to see a person actually embrace that, realize these things themselves and then do something about it and change it. It's just amazing. So, so just for a starting point then for someone new to you, do you tend to, because we, we know like, you know, there's always, you can't do the physical without the mental side of it. Like mm -hmm. we know that ourselves, there's always, an, there's always some sort of emotions or feelings that's got to be unearthed um, as part of that journey. And, and, but whenever you're first starting out with someone new, do you tend to go with the physical side first or do you start with the mental yeah. side? So, you know what I mean? Do because someone's coming to you that could be, depending on yeah. where their situation is, how vulnerable maybe they're feeling at that moment, you know, it's a, 
the, the honest answer is we just decide at the time after conversation yeah, kiss by kiss. yeah the thing is with it the ideal scenario is we do both at the same time right but humans not being that open to doing both things at the same time because they're generally overwhelmed and in panic by the time they get to our door um <laughs> yeah. not panic but they're they're not in a great place so the thing is is that it's really making a judgment call of who's going to serve them best at the time without overwhelming them yeah. because if someone comes in a lot of fear and they're a lot they're quite shut down and there's a lot going on from emotionally talking to me about their biochemistry is about their worst nightmare it's things they will dream about <laughs> right so the thing is with it is that i can do the very simple things and just say look you know we're not looking for any miracles here i just want you to eat some more green leafy vegetables or cruciferous vegetables or you know some good quality fats or some consistent protein i can do that very basic bit why marta can start helping them just stop from closing down. Because the, the biggest thing that will stop people failing is getting, keeping their, what we call their prefrontal cortex online. If you can't do that, then success with a client is nearly out the door because prefrontal cortex is what regulates decision-making. And so it gives context to everything. So the thing is, when it's you the have someone responsible for the interpretation, right? There. Exactly. So if you are in a position where you're in a lot of threat, you have a lot of cortisol and other neurotransmitters, inflammatory cytokines that get exposed to your prefrontal cortex. What will happen is it will shut that prefrontal cortex off. So it goes down to layer one of the brain, which is automatic survival. Right? Survival. So then you're talking to someone who is never going to listen. It doesn't matter how good their intention is, how much they want to change consciously or anything. If we can't lift them out of that state, that's where obviously deep breathing, mindfulness, calming down the nervous system, all these things are such useful tools. If we can't do that with someone, then honestly, their likelihood of change long term is very, very little because we just won't get any access. And the automatic response that they're feeling is so much stronger than any of us. Can get hold of because they've experienced it maybe for 20 30 40 50 years mm -hmm. yeah wow yeah and i can imagine that you know i suppose on a case by case it probably decides how long you need to work with someone as well because it could you know yeah. you're probably talking at least six months maybe for most would it be would that for be majority the case? of people it is at least six months the thing is that people can when we address their physiology specifically um at the beginning and help them raise their awareness that they can have a different outcome in life. It's, it's a matter of weeks. Yeah, they're ready. However, mm -hmm. they will obviously get improvement of symptoms and just a different outlook on, on their life. However, that's the, it's like someone going to the gym for the first time. If they have a decent induction, a decent program written, within a few weeks, they'll be like, holy shit, what happened, right? Newbies <laughs> games. It's the same thing is then helping people over the bridge of change, as I call it, where they get to understand that those initial improvements is just a boost for them to keep going. And mm -hmm. yes, their body is changing. Yes, their mindset is changing. However, we've had people that required a minimum of 18 months because some of their pathways physiologically were so shut down, numb, receptors completely blocked, all sorts of stuff going on where they just literally couldn't function. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's about going slow. Yes, they'll get that initial improvement. Yes, they get that breathing space to keep going, but it sometimes takes a, a relatively long time. However, if someone suffered for 10, 15 years, is 18 months or two years really that long? Yeah. Well, and the thing is, really, you said it perfectly. Like we, we have a client at the moment who has been struggling with autoimmune disease um, and depression for 15 years. And like she messaged us last week and she was like, I've had six days symptom free mm. for like the first time in, you know, that whole period of time. And she's like, she is just someone that is just ready. You know, when you've got to a point where you've looked for so many different answers, you've looked for so many different things that are going on mm -hmm. and she just couldn't find that answer. So when she turned up at our door, it was just a point of readiness. Yeah. And so whatever we were going to tell her or speak to her about, she was just like a sponge. And she was just at a point of readiness. So it's not necessarily a typical result, but it is an example 
of how quickly someone can shift, even though they've been in this story for such a long period of time. Mm -hmm. But as we said to her, this isn't the end, right? This is the start. This is the start to prove what's possible to you, but you now are on the ride. So what happens on that ride is that they don't all just like, it'd be a boring ride if we're just doing this, right? <laughs> yeah. like, did, I, did I really pay for that? So, like Marta said so beautifully earlier, you have to experience both sides of it. You have to know that contrast. So she's yeah. going to have days where symptoms come back. She's going to have a mind flare up again. She's going to have all these things come on. But with the tools she's been taught by Marta or the physiology that I'm rebalancing with her, rather than feel disempowered about what she experiences, she can go, okay, it's like a mental tick list. Okay, what's going on here? And then if she doesn't have the answer, she can come to us. But the, the idea is that we give them as much empowerment as possible so that they don't have to lean on us all the time. You know, for mm -hmm. a certain period, maybe, because they need evidence, right? Confidence, all that kind of stuff comes from that repetition from us. But for the majority, the way we teach it is that personal responsibility bit is the thing that's going to change your life in one year, five years, 10 years down the line when we're not in the picture. Well, if you think about it, to mention another client who this person that Cliff was talking about, she's been on a mindfulness journey for a while now. She understands the concepts that we're talking about. So for her, it's just going deeper into unraveling who she is, what her stories are and what she's going to do about them. We have another client who started with us in January who's never really had any exposure to mindfulness, to, to like comprehending his emotions. Plus he's a dude as well. There's a physical study that proves that 65, 65% of, of men would rather be electrocuted than talk about their emotions. Wow. Physical study is fucking incredible. But anyway, <laughs> <Wow>. electrocuted. <laughs> but use that my husband gone. <laughs> what <did you> know? <laughs> You know, that, that part of the human population that doesn't like talking about emotions and processing them. So for him, wow. even experiencing something like, you know, he's come out of a relationship that wasn't really serving him, had some challenges in the business, his health has been suffering forever. And, you know, for him to even experience on one of our calls, he turned up with his prefrontal cortex completely shut off. Everything was just like me throwing stuff and it was just bouncing off the wall. And I was like, okay, dude, we're just gonna do something different here. Very quick mini meditation over a couple of minutes, literally some deep breathing. And his stress level from eight out of 10 went down to four out of 10 within literally two minutes, right? So the next question from me was like, but is it gonna last? <laughs> well, <laughs> how long will you allow for it to last? Yeah. So even allowing people to understand that it's down to them to take that responsibility, that it's not my magic dust that I sprinkled over him that made it go down from eight to four. I might have said some words and told him how to breathe, but he did it and he can do it again. So it's not, the question isn't how long will it last, it's what am I going to do next time it happens? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Oh, wow. I'm there's so many questions in my head. Um, right, I'm going to just switch lanes for a second, just to give my brain a rest. Because it's, it's all too emotional for me being a man, you know, I can't handle it. <laughs> He's hitting the like, electronic buzz. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In, in my red room. Um, <laughs> no joke between me and Gillian. Um, anyway. So Cliff, you've been, I've, obviously I've followed you for quite a while now and you both, you've both come from the PT background, haven't you? You're both a PTs yeah. at one point. Um, and obviously from a nutrition point of view, one of the big things you probably both see is, well, if you want to lose weight, it's calories in, calories out. Um, <laughs> Down the rabbit hole we go. Oh, oh here we go. <laughs> Let, yeah. let's, let's keep it. Uh, but which, 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 you know, an energy balance is pretty fundamental. Yeah, but sure. obviously in your, in your, you know, in the things you teach people and show people, there is a little bit more to people um, losing weight than just energy in, energy out. Mm -hmm. so just, just give me a little, a little flavour. A little bit. <laughs> <laughs> oh dear. <laughs> um, so a little bit. Um, okay. So if, if we think about like calories in, calories out as a concept, right? Most people, you know listening to this or, or watching it won't really know what the true measurement of a calorie is, right? About heating and yada, yada, yada. So the thing is heating with it- Heating exploding. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> the thing is with it is that 
energy balance absolutely plays a role. We understand this, right? We, you know, if someone's eating 10,000 calories from a piece of cake a day and they're not moving and they're high stress, you know, their body's not going to work well for them. Do you see what I mean? But I feel what we've kind of missed is context. And the reason we've done this is because it's much easier. And the way the human brain works is we love absolutes, right? So it's much easier to say, well, if you're in a calorie deficit, you will lose weight, right? That's just the easiest way to do it. And it also abstains from a lot of responsibility because when a client isn't losing weight, you're a liar. <laughs> that's, that's it. That's, that's actually the fitness, health and wellness space, essentially, unfortunately. That's basically it. That's why they end up at our door. So the thing is, is that what I want people to understand is that, you know, nutrient density has to be part of the conversation for anyone. Like that is just the most common sense, simple thing. And, you know, for me, when I have clients that have binged eat, eaten because of emotional things or whatever it might be for such a long period of time, telling them that 20% of their calories can come from whatever they want a day doesn't seem like the cleverest emotional choice I can give them. Yeah. Right. And so then if they have health issues going on, let's, you know, we could segue into the gut, for instance, if they have health issues going on, they're not absorbing properly. Maybe there's dysbiosis, imbalanced bacteria, yeast, fungal issues, like that are potentially going on for a person. The way they process that food is not all the same. Mm -hmm. Like just by saying someone has a certain amount of calories, like misses maybe about 20 processes and like assuming a lot. And this is why we get ourselves into a lot of issues. Just because you eat food doesn't mean you absorb it, right? Yeah. Like that's a massive gross oversimplification over of something. We're assuming that they have the right levels of stomach acid. We're assuming they have the right levels of bile, of enzymes, of brush border health or gut health, any of these things of which we know they don't. So the problem is, it's not to say everyone's not well and that they should get rid of calories and thinking like this, but it's also not to simplify it. But I think the problem is, and I don't want to be hard on the industry here, is most people just don't have the knowledge that's required to explain it deeper than that level. Like the, I'm talking to sports nutritionists here a lot of the time, because they'll love protein synthesis. And we can talk about mTOR all day and the amount of, you know, all these different amino acids we need to make these things happen. It's all sexy, but it means nothing if the person has cell dysfunction, if they have inflammation going on. So I think like people get lost in the things they feel the most comfortable with. Sports scientists find that in, you know, protein synthesis, for instance. In the spiritual realm, they find that in some elusive thing. And other people find it in their thing. And I think the most important thing to do with someone is to treat them like an individual. And for us, when we sit with someone, we, we're kind of, I suppose the Pareto principle is one of the most important things, like whether we agree it's 80, 20 or whatever, doesn't really matter, but the principle's kind of improving over and over. The, for us, it's like what 20% for this person is going to get them 80% of the way there? Yep. You know, if someone who comes to us who's an elite athlete or they're a CEO or they're a high performing person, me getting them to track the calories every single day is not gonna be the thing that they're gonna get off on, right? And it's not to say we can just give them supplements that get them around the corner, that isn't responsibility. But there are certain things we can do to optimize. Like, if you want someone to control their calories, just correct their circadian rhythm. Like, honestly, to probably 60, 70% of people's overeating is purely because of how messed up their circadian rhythm is. Because- We didn't get enough sleep. Well, yeah. So one part of it is the sleep, right? But what we know about circadian rhythm is it resets and sets many of your hormonal pathways. Mm -hmm. So the thing is with it, you know, if you think of leptin, ghrelin, hunger, and, you know, satiety hormones, they're all regulated by these on off switches. And we can go really, really deep, even to like in the cell where we know that circadian rhythm switches a lot of these things on and off as well. So the thing is with it, is what we're having here is we're having people have more and more disturbed sleep patterns. So, you know, you've got the 5am club and, 
you know, the don't go to bed hustle club and all the people in the middle. But let's just say this is a normal person who goes to work for eight, 10 hours a day, right? The issue is they come home, they have children, they, you know, they have things to do, they've got commitments, and then they want to like calm down. And their way of calming down is scrolling on their phone. I say calming down, it's distracting, but they, they think it's calming down. So it's like scrolling on their phone or watching TV for a few hours or whatever it might be. It's just not engaging their brain. The problem is the amount of effect that's having on them with regards to them getting a good quality sleep and then resetting themselves. You know, most of them are not going to bed till 11, 12, one o'clock, which is already causing big issues. And then, then they're getting up early. And so we're not going through full cycles and therefore they're not resetting these in super important rhythms. You know, I could talk about circadian rhythm forever because it's, you know, such an important thing. So for me, yes, I don't think people are stupid. You see what I mean? Like if you say to someone, look, do you realize you're overeating? Okay, first there comes denial because they don't want to be seen as that person, right? So we always go into denial because it feels threatening. But when we say, look, we're not judging you, like, but do you believe you've been overeating? Well, yeah, when I get stressed, you know, when I get, you know, tired or whatever it is. Okay, well, could we help you deal with the stress then? Could we help you deal with being tired? Because how many people, when they feel good, go and binge eat? No. <laughs> Not that many, right? Yeah. Like people binge eat for a reason. And it's not because things are going good. They don't just go, oh, I feel amazing. I'm going to go and eat seven chocolate bars. <laughs> Unless they go to Nando's, then... Yes. <laughs> but you see what I mean? Like, the thing is with it is that, you know, you can be in a position, people could argue, no, I feel good when I drink. And I'm like, well, no, you probably don't. You're probably worried about being rejected, so you just drink to fit in. That's a different question, right? So the thing is, is that I feel there's so much more we could talk about that calories just doesn't really cover. And I think if people could understand why they're stressed, and address these things, make simple steps towards it, and they can sort out their circadian rhythm, just ensuring they get for a guy seven to eight hours of sleep, six to eight in the summer, and then for a woman, normally seven to nine, generally about an hour more to reset a lady because you girls are a little bit more complex than guys. <laughs> um, just hormonal it's special system. is the word, isn't it? <laughs> yes, but the truth is, your, you know, your cycles, your hormonal systems, yeah. all this kind of stuff, the resetting of them are you know, more complex, there's more things to be considered. So the thing is with it is that these things get to be honored. You see what I mean? But you've got uh, a lifestyle now in the Western world that doesn't really make people believe that it's possible. So you've got all these people just like fighting to do something all the time. So, you know, that's, that's keeping it very surface level of like why I don't think calories are the only thing, but I could go a lot deeper. <laughs> of course. And and I, th I think one aspect of it as well is because there's there's no not enough physical activity. There's a lot of mental activity during the day or in the evening, but yeah. there's not a lot of physical. Yeah. So so you know that's part of the rebalance, and I think as well is to actually get our our muscles to be doing things. So it's you know well, getting those um, anabolic hormones yeah. kicked well, we up. Know, you know, sedentary uh, people who are sedentary kills more people than people who smoke at the moment. Right? Yeah. So the thing is with it is that we all know smoking's bad, but apparently sitting on our ass watching, you know, God knows how many hours of TV every night is okay because we need a rest. But the, the issue is, is, you know, pretty much one of the biggest indicators of how healthy someone's going to be in later in life is how much muscle mass they've retained, right? So right. it's not to yeah. say that everyone should go out weight training, but to be physical, to move your body, whether it's body weight, whether it's yoga, whether it's Pilates or something like this, is going to in 20, 30 years, and that's the hardest part of this game because it's delayed gratification. That's why people don't stop smoking, right? So like, oh, I didn't get cancer after one cigarette. <laughs> so the thing is, is that this delayed gratification has to be practiced every day because we live in a world of just constant instant gratification, yeah. right? I want something, oh, I can Google it. Or I want something, I can Amazon Prime it. Or do you see what I mean? Like it can happen so fast. Mm -hmm. Everyone thinks, oh, I'll think about that later. But, and then later comes and then they're like, oh, I've got a disease. Well, or... if you think about, we can use my mum as a perfect example. She wasn't really ready to, because she's too close, she's family, um, but she wasn't really ready to take on board our advice fully for, for years. And my dad passed away three years ago now. 
And after he died, I think she started thinking about herself and her health differently. And within the first six to 10 months, she just deteriorated massively. And my parents weren't really close anyway. So it's not because she's lost her soulmate. It was more because she's lost the purpose of looking after him. They mm -hmm. lived together, but practically separate, but she still did look after him. So it was giving her something to do because she's been retired for over 10, close to 15 years now. Mm -hmm. And after my dad passed away, clearly that purpose wasn't there anymore. So she became even more sedentary, started just spending more and more time on her laptop playing games or like watching sports, you know, it was stimulating mentally, but there was practically zero mobility, zero movement. And her food was all over the place. She wasn't really eating that much. And she came to us in July last year asking questions. And I said, look, if you're ready to take responsibility, I'm happy to play the coach role here, but we need to separate the daughter and the, and the coach or a mentor role here. And she's actually really good at it. She's very logical because she's an engineer. Um, so that was really easy. But I said to her, we're not looking for a monster here. We're not looking for some, you know, parasite that's sitting here or something that's eating away at you, whatever. There is a possibility of infections. But once we tested her, there was nothing like that. She was almost expecting for us to drop a bomb on her and say, look, that's it. And once we deal with that, you'll be fine. And I said, where you find yourself right now is not a result of one thing. It's years of not looking after yourself. So if you're ready and in a position when you can take responsibility for taking smaller steps, but consistently over a longer period of time, you'll turn that ship around and you will feel different. And six months later, seven maybe now, she's 25 kilos lighter. Like it's insane. And all she did, she did obviously go through some protocols and realigned her physiology with Cliff, but nothing really complicated. But she's evened out her meal times, started drinking more water, and started going for walks. Honestly, I shit you not, she's not going to the gym, she's not running. She's 67. Yeah. This is yeah. what I mean. Right. Like, you know, like people say, I don't, this is not towards your mum, but people say <laughs> old, old dogs are new tricks, right? <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. But my, my point is, is there is never a, a point where we're not ready. Like, or we can't be ready, or we can't make that decision. Like, how many people just say, oh, it's just a part of getting older? Like, as soon as someone says that in the room, I'm the first one who goes, that's bullshit. <laughs> yeah. like, I can't help but say it out loud. Yeah. Because when we've helped people come out of some of the most terrible positions you can imagine quite late in life, it's just not true. It's yeah. just that when we are surrounded by an environment where that is the constant thing that's being asserted so if everyone around you believes that as you get older things get worse or you know you get sicker or yeah. whatever the situation is then that's what you're going to find is going to come true it's that tribe mentality yeah and if you think another example um my mom's just been such an incredible case study for us and for ourselves because she loves geeking out on everything she does with us but if you think about it we got her from pre-diabetic to like perfect blood glucose and it, it, it took a few months because of her habits and she still smokes but she stopped adding sugar to her drinks and things like that just out of her own will, which was amazing. So we got her down to really nice level blood glucose levels, which she's been measuring her fasted blood glucose levels for weeks now. Um, and she picked something up, some sort of food poisoning, um, didn't feel well, her stomach started hurting and the blood glucose just shot up straight after that. And it's been quite high for the last two, three weeks now. And her stomach's been hurting. So we've been investigating a little bit, a little bit more, um, going a bit deeper. There's likely something that we need to remove because she probably picked something up through that food poisoning. And if you think about it, if she went to the doctor now, they'll tell her she's pre-diabetic. Mm. But is she really? Mm. Her body's under more stress. Something's going on in her gut. Blood glucose is elevated. But it's nothing to do with being pre-diabetic. So just paying attention to things like that even and understanding that it's not just one black and white answer and it's investigating a little bit more into our client's history into looking what's going on with their lives outside of just what they come to you with it's zooming out and going higher up and looking from a bird's eye view perspective at the entire environment as well it just gives you so much more to work with yeah and the you know the the key thing is about keeping it simple right like if you can, I generally find, and there's so much research on blood glucose management. If you can get someone to balance their blood glucose management, you 
will have a different person within a few weeks. Yeah. Like we now know about hyperglycemia, so too much blood glucose, right? So people talk about it in the blood, but what people don't talk about is hyperglycemia with regards to what it gets exposed to the gut lining. So what you have here is when you have too much blood glucose and it's getting into the gut, you have, your, you have a nervous system in your gut called the enteric nervous system. Mm -hmm. Too much glucose and these uh, exposed to the enteric nerve cells will essentially completely dysregulate your thoughts. Yeah, because what will happen is it will basically via the enteric nervous system go via the vagus nerve to the brain, and this is why pretty much everyone you see with depression and anxiety also have gut issues. And literally, like I've got one lady at the moment who just sent me all her blood glucose data over for the last week, and like you know she's waking up with fasted blood glucoses of sevens and eights. Oh, shit. And like the thing is, is that you know to give you an idea, like great ranges for me are somewhere between 4.4 .4 and 4.9. Like these are kind of numbers I'm looking for for people. Optimal ranges, not doctor's ranges necessarily. Um, and like when I said to her, like, how do you feel? She's like, my brain's foggy. I've got no energy. And it's like, well, that's kind of obvious. Because if you're exposing your body, we're not even talking about in the, you know, you know the inability of insulin at this point. If we're just talking about what you're battering your gut with, you're going to have less enzyme activity, less ability to absorb nutrients. You're going to deplete yourself of B vitamins, all of these things for energy pathways. So it doesn't even need to be difficult. Mm -hmm. It could be, what can we do to just get you balanced in your blood glucose levels? To start with, right? And that will regulate mood better. Therefore, if they've got better mood, they're going to less overeat. And what did she say at the beginning? I just want Cliff to help me kill my sugar addiction. Yeah. <laughs> the sugar addiction. It's like a self-fulfilling prophecy. Once yeah. you get yourself locked up in it, if you don't have the understanding of what's going on and what to do with it, you just keep going. Mm. So it's yeah. then again, turning the ship and shifting the loop to something to, that, that serves you more. Yeah. Well, that's um, an interesting point though, Marta. And when Cliff mentioned it before, I... I've got clients who are cla the classic line is, well, you know, I'm perimenopausal, so that's it. I'm going to get bigger and all that kind of stuff. But then when I look, they're sat in the pub with all of yeah. their kind of perimenopausal mates yeah. saying the same thing. And I'm like, well, of course, that's going to happen if you start, if you, you're invested in that thing. That's, that's yeah. the tribe, right? That's yeah. the belief in the tribe. Well, and also like, you know, like I get so many people who come to me in menopause. It's just like, it's the most overdone thing I think ever, apart from PMS. Um, and the thing is, is that that might annoy a lot of people because they have horrendous <laughs> menopause of PMS, but genuinely it's not that difficult to correct. But the thing is, is that you can't get away from it. If you have, let's say, too much blood glucose and then you have too little, right? We regulate it very tightly in the blood. What is the thing that keeps blood glucose up? Cortisol, mm -hmm. yeah. right? So cortisol is a stress hormone which if you think about it, if you've got too much cortisol going on, you'll be in the sympathetic nervous system, fight or flight. Mm -hmm. For a lady who's perimenopausal or menopausal, the way they're gonna create their estrogen is from their adrenals by DHEA. So if they have too high a blood glucose and it keeps going up and down, up and down because the body's trying to re-regulate it, you're gonna put more stress on the adrenals, you're gonna take them offline from the ability to produce DHEA, and therefore, you're going to have more issues creating symptoms. Yeah, exactly. And that's why you're going to get weight gain issues because your appetite's going to be disrupted as well. Yeah. But if you can re-regulate that pathway from them, it's, well, it's easy. We've had women that for some it was probably not what they actually wanted. But after a few months working with us, when their periods have already stopped, they started again. <laughs> It was just like, yeah, menopause, and we'll be like, maybe not. Yeah, because <laughs> I actually have a, a client that I'm working with at the minute, and she went and had tests done because she thought that her periods have basically stopped for over a year, and she thought, I'll go and get tested just to see if that's because of the menopause, mm -hmm. but she was told no. But she yeah. does travel a lot. She does have a very high-powered job. She does have, you know, mm -hmm. so, um, which it is going to change soon. So I'm kind of waiting for her to tell me that, <laughs> that's going to kick back in yeah. soon so uh, but i'll talk to you like just you know every day i read something or i read a study or i you know hear from a client or whatever and you you never get bored of hearing how amazing the human body is mm -hmm. 
Hmm. Like, if you give it a chance, like, it is insane. Insane. Like, even I was reading a study before I came on this call, literally about talking about, people talk about cancer, for instance, being genetic a lot of the time, and it's almost like we can do nothing about it past these therapies. And so what we now understand is pivotal to cancer is the ability for cells to proliferate. Okay, so this is where medications come in in order to stop this kind of stuff happening. But the other side of that is the nucleus in the cell, where these you know cells are being replicated and these signals. But what we now know is, if for instance the mitochondria, which are like the batteries of the cell, can be re-regulated and they're healthy, which provide energy to the nucleus, then actually the cells that then get produced are not more tumor cells. And so without getting too much into the science of it, like people need to understand that they've got so much more control of what their body's doing and what the outcomes are rather than like, especially because something like cancer, I know we're talking about that, but it's such a scary word for so many people. Like it's like, it's almost like the end. Like it's a matter of time rather than if you can get better. And you know, it's, I think if people could really from today take home that they've got so much more power over their mind, their emotions, their physical body of what's happening, rather than just believing that it's happening to them, then if they could do that, then, you know, they'd, they'd feel much better about it, more content, easier. Because, you know, from what we know about genetics, you know, tw it's arguable, but 20 to 30%, you know, is decided by genetics. And if anyone was going to be screwed by now, it was me, right? Like with all the <laughs> things that I've had, it shouldn't yeah. be me. But what, you know, like if you think about it, uh, we as humans, about all of your genes, your mammalian genes, only make up about 10 to 15 percent of the total genes. Oh, we know that, that we have my banana, right? Yeah, yeah. Well, but the thing is, is if you think about it, you have more genes present from the bacteria in your gut than you do in your whole genome, which is about 23,000 genes. So, if you could control the microbiome, you would control a lot of these genes at a very cell level. And I know that's getting a bit deep, but that's why I became obsessed with the gut as well, because between cell health and the gut, if you can re-regulate those two with people, then you know people generally do pretty well. Yeah. Awesome. Oh, wow. And yeah, and there's one actually one key aspect that or something that I came across recently as well was talking around about about a lot of the times, you know, people when we were maybe overweight, it, it does come down, there is the emotions that is probably what started it all at the very, very beginning, you know? Um, I, I listened to a podcast that was referred to as emotional indigestion, basically. It's, it's, mm -hmm. it's there at that such a deep level that, that, oh, that you know, it, it, it's, this is for some it transpires as being overweight, some people it transpires yeah. Yeah, yeah. as alcohol yeah. or whatever, you know, that, and that's usually the, I'm going to use another client story here that I feel will be very, very visual for people to, you know, it's probably going to be shocking and quite challenging to grasp at the start. But when you wrap your head around that, that there is more than calories in, in and calories out, there's more than motivation. There, there's so much more than that. And when you're willing to go there and explore, but you have to take responsibility for it, you'll see why you might have not been successful in getting to wherever you want to get to in life, whether health or any other aspect. A client of ours who was heavily overweight, couldn't lose weight, got to the point where she had to wear compression stockings to relieve the, the pressure and the, and the tension in her legs from the extra weight, couldn't quite understand what was going on. There was one story with her emotional overeating certain foods connected to her husband that tragically died in a in a bicycle accident but really truly what she understood because she was like i just don't love myself enough what she understood through one of our calls and i think it was even our very first call together it just it just unraveled. came out and unraveled through our conversation when i think she was a teenager when her dad got disabled in an accident and she had to put compression stockings on him for him to be able to walk yes. so she learned at the time that looking after someone is putting compression stockings on. 
So at the time when I think it was young teenage years, it's about five to seven years of our life, the first five to seven years of our lives where we just take shit in on autopilot. We can't discern whether it's right or wrong or whether it's going to serve us or not. So it, it, because it was such an emotionally loaded experience, she just on autopilot made that association that putting compression stockings on someone, and it's on a subconscious level, she didn't know that, that means to look after someone. So for her being so heavily overweight that she had to put compression stockings on herself, to her subconscious belief, it meant that she's looking after herself, that she's caring for herself. Wow. But in order to do that, to validate putting compression stockings on, she had to be heavily overweight. When we're talking about it on a conscious level, it's completely logical, right? It doesn't make any sense. Why would you do that to yourself? That's conscious. Conscious is the tip of the iceberg. Mm -hmm. Subconscious stories and beliefs, they, they're impersonal. They cannot decide whether being overweight and putting compression stockings is good or bad. She learned at that time in her life that this is what looking after someone is very literal belief. So what do I need to do? And that's happening without our awareness. What do I need to do in my life to look after myself? I need to be heavily overweight, put compression stockings on. So technically she was loving on herself, looking after herself on a deep subconscious level initially, but when we brought it out to the surface, can you imagine? Initially, yeah. it was very shocking. I call it the illogical logic. When you understand why this was happening, it's perfectly logical. And our brains are very logical, how they sort stuff out and that, how it goes into which part of our mind and how it goes into our subconscious mind to then make our lives easier. It's yeah. fascinating to be able to unravel stories like that. It's just... <laughs> I, I can't even describe it in words. It's just very, very fascinating and very rewarding when you can help someone regain that freedom and that power over their destiny, if you like. Yeah. Awesome. And, and, and allow them to see that there's like a way to change it, like I guess, is, you know. Things, I suppose like one thing I would say to people is that the reason so many people struggle to change is because simply they start with behavior. So they start with, I need to change a diet. I need to change, you know, my mindset. So I need a self-help book or whatever it might be. But the problem with behavior is going back to the dopamine reward system right at the start of this was that behavior falls in the middle. So if you try and change behavior, you haven't understood what the trigger was, why you even took the behavior. And then what the underlying reward system is, is exactly what Mark spoke about there. So the, the whole idea of what we do at the ARA method is to deal with the trigger and the underlying reward system. Because when you do that, the behavior is almost, it looks automatic for someone because it just is nonsensical anymore for them. Because mm -hmm. when they truly get what they're connecting to or what the triggers might be, or when I hang around these people, I feel like I need to drink. Or when I you know, spend time with these people, I tend to overeat. Like, you know, we hear it all the time. Oh, my grandma just overfeeds me. Do you see what I mean? Like when we go around to grandma's house, like she'll just give me loads of food. And just because it's their way of connecting, right? And very often they grew up in a time where they didn't have that luxury. Like we still have generations that grew up in that time post-war where food was very scarce for them. So their gift is to almost be able to present it to people because they like couldn't do it before. So, and there's a difference between saying, look, no, grandma, you're trying to, you know, self-sabotage all of my hard work and going, look, I can have a small amount, like that can fit into what I want to do, but I just don't, don't be offended if I don't eat all 17 cakes that you've presented to me. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like it's, it's, it's understanding the middle ground. And when you're empowered because you understand the triggers and the underlying reward system, you can just be much more matter of fact about it. And you don't necessarily worry what other people think because you know it's not about you. Like that's really it, you know, when you've made a decision and so many of your clients and ours will be the same, you make a decision, you're like, right, this is the time I'm gonna change. Like your chance to validate that change is gonna come thick and fast. You know, mm -hmm. you're gonna go out with friends and be like, oh, it's just one piece of cake, that won't hurt. It's like, yeah, say that's some with celiac. Um, <laughs> so the thing is that, you see what I mean? Like, or oh, just wondering how much could it hurt? And it's like, you know, it, we always say to people, just be the, the number one decider for us, whether someone's going to be successful in their pursuit is who they're surrounded by and how often they're surrounded by them. 
because like, for instance, that lady who was struggling for 15 years with autoimmune and her depressive issues, she has a, the most supportive partner. And so when we go and tell her stuff, she immediately shares with him and he's like, yeah, I'm right behind you. But unconsciously, a lot of partners and a lot of family members get threatened because when you make a change, that makes them unconsciously look at their decisions. And that's really uncomfortable for a lot of people. Mm -hmm. And that's why they then throw it back at you and be like, oh, it's just one drink or it's just this. Because they think it's easier to pull you down to where you are or to they are than it is for them to step up to where they're. And that's what people have to be aware of is that people are not doing this on purpose, self-sabotage them. They're doing it to protect the identity they've built over 20, 30, 40 years. And that's why like, we have to become the observer of the situation and the environment of what's really going on rather than just like, that whole tribe mentality is I need to fit in so I must eat this thing otherwise I'll be lonely forever <laughs> you see but what that's I mean? essentially what the driver behind yeah. it is but it's understanding that it's it's very primal it is there yeah. but we have the ability to correct it to have a conversation with ourselves on a conscious level and on an unconscious level whether it's through meditation through hypnosis and, and things like that various energetic and emotional healing um, processes and, and modalities it's about bringing the two together we can't ever fully bring them together because one is like Japanese bullet train and the other is like an old school steam train but they can work together not against each other and that's the power in the process yeah absolutely and you, you're touching on on like food beliefs there and as well like the classic example is having to finish your plate wasn't it it's like yeah. you know you were brought up like 33 percent bigger <laughs> <laughs> but it was like it was it was it was either your mother's love for you to to feed you you know that was her role and and it almost like validated your mother's role i suppose to yeah. that you finished it that was well you don't get dessert unless you finished the food that you <laughs> stuffed with yeah. so you're really stuffed you can't eat any more but if you don't finish it you're not going to yeah. get dessert Always room for ice cream. Just melts the nip, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> oh, a bit. Awesome. A bit. We've been here for an hour and 12 minutes, guys. Like, I mean, I could see. I don't know about you. Can just keep going, right? I'm, I'm like, love it. Yeah, I'm, I'm all yeah. over. This is, this is me. I'm like, yeah. I love this. <laughs> no, it's been fascinating. I've enjoyed listening to it. There is so much more you could go into. Probably so many cases as well. Just... Like you said, there's lots of stories how people have gone just just seeing people's transformations. I'm sure it's been just so rewarding as well for you as well. But the thing is, is that you you also learn from you know your own involvement, and there's you know there's pieces to our own puzzle that we're still working out, right? And at the end of the day, like you know, Marta's like the guinea pig for me. It's perfect when I learn new methodologies <laughs> and I learn new things. Like I can try them on Marta and. You know, one of Marta's frustrations over the years was it feels trickier for her to lose body fat, to lose weight, to maintain it at a level of ease without having to really push herself really hard. Mm -hmm. And so, but she also would lean towards previously more anger with regards to what would go on for emotional state when she would get triggered. And so there's reasons for that. But most people just think that's part of who I am. But yet, for instance, when we genetically tested her, well, what we know is the more, the more estrogen you have, it kind of works on a curve. It's like a bell curve. So there's like a peak point for dopamine. This makes you feel good. And then going past that peak point, one of the drivers is estrogen because estrogen inhibits the breakdown of dopamine, mm -hmm. right? So what happens you know is that... You know these guys wrap up, right? I know. No, 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 no. no. Okay. <laughs> basically what happens when you have people who have they're pushing dopamine hard especially ladies mm. and then for instance they can't metabolize estrogen properly because they have an impaired what we call comt gene then what happens is you start getting a build-up of these metabolites this is where we end up in anger and rage and so for instance but also you can't metabolize estrogen which means mm. then progesterone estrogen imbalances all start to happen and Someone like Marta, for instance, becomes disillusioned because she's moving her body, she's tracking her calories, she's doing all these things, but yet the physical result isn't necessarily there. 
But what we've started doing now is started correcting these genes and how they're expressing and what's going on. Like she had one day, I think it was last week or something like this, and she woke up and I was like, oh, how do you feel? She's like, I feel so mellow. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, right, you okay? <laughs> like, I don't know what's happening. <laughs> but because, because for so many years, because this impairment in this gene essentially means you don't metabolize stress neurotransmitters very well. Mm-hmm. So you're always going to be like pretty switched on. Always on edge. Right? Less content, always on edge. So when I start making these pathways clear and work as they should, the way she should feel is calmer, content, right? So that's how we want it to be. But the thing is with it, like for everybody who's listening or watching is that you don't need to go to that level to start with. Like all the basics of blood sugars and the things we spoke about could help most of that stuff. It's like emotionally we kind of peeling the layers off. With that, we building up, yeah, starting exactly. with the basics mm-hmm. and then going, well, it yeah. could work both ways, really. But it, it's kind of cool. I like to look at it that way. You're peeling it off and then you're building it up right yeah. on the <laughs> other side. Yeah. It's starting with the foundations first yeah. and only then going deeper down the rabbit hole, whether you look at specific testing or even as far as looking at your genes and what's impaired and stuff like that. You know, we do that because it's just fun for us to geek out. And it is a relief for me to also get answers after, you know, 15 years of that awareness of like, what the fuck is wrong with me? <laughs> <laughs> awesome. So but at the same time, the, the foundation of that learning through us like i said at the very beginning it brings us back full cycle of our own experiences turning them into our gift that we can then offer to our clients i wouldn't have it any other way yes it's frustrating for me personally at points but as a stimulus for growth it's it's incredible yeah. well, I'll start talking now. <laughs> no, 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 no. It's, it's cool i think i think me and jillian probably have clients that come to us looking for some fancy nutrition plan like yeah. you have to do intermittent there's fun. something different yeah there's something special that they need <laughs> like, just eat some vegetables like god damn it yeah. Go yeah. lunchtime get some sunlight like have a bit of a bedtime routine and they're like oh it wasn't like magical I'm like well <laughs> need to yeah. be often unless but, you're doing these things consistently right there's no point looking yeah. at anything that to them might be magical because it sounds fancy yeah hey, man. like it's literally it like you hit the nail on the head perfectly is that you know 90 percent of the stuff that i know is irrelevant to 99 percent of people <laughs> <laughs> you know what i mean like it's great for me because i'm a geek and i love it and i've used yeah. it on my own health and obviously for marta because I'm probably one of the exceptions because, you know, I can thank my mom and dad for amazing genetics. And so <laughs> the thing is, is that, you know, I've been my own practice, but, you know, you've said it perfectly. If people were just more mindful, if they were just, you know, taking some time to breathe a few times a day, get some sunlight, hydrate themselves, eat vegetables. Like, you know, we, most of us would be in a much, much better place. But again, it's practicing that delayed gratification, right? It's just, it doesn't feel sexy enough. Yeah. yeah. There's no, there's no instant result to it, is there? Yeah. yeah. Oh, wow. And I've, I've got one last question. Please don't shoot me, Jill. <laughs> um, Cliff, your thoughts on intermittent fasting, specifically yeah. for women trying to lose weight, because it seems to be the new one on the block. Like we've kind of gone from, Keto, no, Atkins to, yeah. in, in it's now. Atkins, just. Oh, oh, right. Yeah. Way back, right? <laughs> all of a sudden now. Oh, I thought about if it's in your macros, that was there on the way. Oh, yeah, yeah, you got to have it. But I feel um, like with most people, they had to go to an extreme. So it was almost like Atkins, keto, then everyone's fasting. Carnival, yeah, carnivores on the carnival. way, wasn't it? Um, mm-hmm. Ironically, I'm veganary. <laughs> so, what are your thoughts on the whole fasting thing, and should everyone be doing it? Because I'm not convinced. Mm-hmm. So, I have a client at the moment. It's actually a man, but I'll talk about women in a second. He actually was doing um, water fast, um, free 72 hour water fast. Um, he was doing them a couple of times a month, and after a year of it, his allergy symptoms all got worse. His immune, his histamine issues all got worse. His brain fog all got worse. And he was like, when I first started, the first couple of months, I felt amazing. 
And so what I want to explain to people is what's really going on is that yes, what we know from the studies is that intermittent fasting, so time restricted eating essentially has a lot of benefits to it, but we all do it already. So some of us do eight hours, some of us do 10 hours, some do 12 because you don't wake up out of habit and eat during the night very often, right? So if your last meal's at eight o'clock and you don't eat another one till eight, then you've done 12 hours, right? It's cool. So what I'm saying is, you know, there was some really good studies that showed a three day, a 72 hour water fast, nearly completely um, rewired the immune system for people. And this study has been cited everywhere, right? About the benefits of time restricted eating and all this kind of stuff. And there's definitely benefits, but in the wrong person at the wrong time, when you haven't got the basics now, it could potentially be a nightmare for someone. Um, because it, if we think of, we store our fat soluble toxins in fat tissue, right? Adipose tissue. So when you do a fast, you go hypocalorific, so low calorie. So that's the first thing, the first point of detoxification. And bear in mind, there's at least three. So the first point is liberation from the tissue. So we pull things out of the tissue, metabolize it into the bloodstream. We then have to, we then have to be able to get it from the bloodstream mm -hmm. into the cell to be detoxified. In the cell, there's at least two phases of detoxification to turn it from fat-soluble toxin to water-soluble. And then we have to get it from the cell to either via the kidneys or via bile into the digestive system. So the biggest problem I find in people is A, they've got quite a lot of stored stuff in fat tissue, okay? So like, if you look at people, we can see you know their, their self-care issues with regards to the products they're putting on their skin every day. If we look at herbicides and pesticides, if we look at all these things, these residues are all getting caught up in cells, the extracellular matrix, as we call it. And so what happens is when you go into this hypercalorific state and you don't have the ability to go through these detoxification pathways, which, you know, most should be able to get it in the cell and most should be able to detoxify it through the first phase, unless you've got fibromyalgia or chronic fatigue or something like this, where that phase gets a little bit um, messed up and they'd probably know because they'd be very sensitive to medications and supplements and stuff like this. But a lot of people, especially ladies are very slow through stage two, uh, what we call conjugation, which is breaking down hormones and, you know, allowing it to be turned into a water soluble toxin. So the problem is if your stage one is at a good speed, but your stage two is slow, you create a lot more, what we call free radicals. They get pumped out into the bloodstream aka headaches, nausea, feeling fatigued, all of these kind of side effects that people get when they do fasting to start with. And everyone's just like, yeah, you're just detoxifying. I'm like, no, that's the problem. You're not. <laughs> right? And yeah. so what I would say is women, due to the complexity of their cycles and how imbalanced I often see their blood glucose levels are, I, you've got to remember fasting we know is a stress on the body because you have to go through something called gluconeogenesis in order to make sure you have enough energy for the brain and all the other things that require it. Mm -hmm. So that's turning non-glucose molecules into glucose. So you need a good B vitamin status, you need a good zinc status, manganese, magnesium, all of these things. Mm -hmm. And for me, for a lot of people, the benefit just isn't there. Um, you know, I get it if I've got someone who's, um, you know, we've got an elite client who's an incredible cyclist and he feels he performs better in the morning when he goes and does a four or five hour ride on a more fasted state in his training rides, but he will still have a gel during the ride or something like that makes sense. So it's not completely fasted electrolytes, all that kind of stuff. But I think what's happened with people is they're confusing things. Because unless you're just drinking water, even if you're having coffee, you are not fasting. Because you still have to metabolize these things via the liver. Even herbal teas. Even herbal teas, because they have to be metabolized via the liver as well. Mm -hmm. so the thing is, is that, you know, people fit it to their bias. So they're like, oh, I'm juice fasting. I'm like, well, no, you're not. 
because <laughs> it's all, like why can't you just say you're having a juice and then you're having a period where you don't eat things like everybody like do you see what i mean like everyone has to tie it to something so it becomes a bit sexier yeah and that's kind of what makes our job more interesting because when people come to us and i have to then dispel all untangle of these things it. untangle it i'm like just be consistent you know just eat regular meals get to your ass to bed when you should stop stressing as much move your body they're like oh yeah someone told me that before <laughs> <laughs> that's so, the story of my that, is, that is like there aren't people that it can work for there absolutely is but in my experience it works better for men than it does women mm -hmm. um but i it would never be my go-to when i first ever see a client yeah knowing what i know about when i test and the things that come up on testing it would never be the first protocol I do with someone. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And it's almost like as well, and like obviously the keto diet is the other one that a lot of people are, are going on about. <laughs> like almost reacts like that. But yeah, it, it, and it's it's the same thing as well. I would always, you know, I guess it's not having carbohydrates, you know, to, to feed your brain and things like that. There, so that's. Um, the what's your thoughts? Is, uh, all of these methodologies can work. If you have the person in the right place that it can work for and it fits their lifestyle, like, you know, the one thing we know about the ketogenic diet is that if you're going to do it, stay on it. Because what they've done is they've done a lot of studies around the microbiome and the, micro the diversity of the microbiome. So we now know it's not about how much of it we have. It's about the diversity of it we have. And one thing we know about the ketogenic diet is it very, very quickly reduces the diversity of the microbiome. So that doesn't have to be a negative as long as you're happy to stay on it for a very long time. Mm -hmm. Because the people who choose to come off it, that's when they start having problems. Yeah, they okay. just get wrecked afterwards, don't they? They're, they're like, they try to go back to carbs and they're like, oh my God, I feel like I'm dying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Also Makes because they're gonna, get a, they're gonna get a temporary insulin resistance as well. Because the thing is, is that because they're not called for insulin very often, the beta cells in the pancreas have down regulated. So then when they then be like, oh, I've had enough of this diet and shit, I'm gonna go and eat some cake. <laughs> they get all the side effects of hyperglycemia, which could be horrendous for people. Hmm. And that's because obviously the body has to have the time to re-regulate again and catch up and work out what it needs to do. Yeah. yeah. And I get, I, I've, I've heard of that before as well. You know, people that just take gluten out of their, their diet if there's no actual real need for it, you know, the same thing, you'll just develop more of an intolerance to it, I suppose, if you well, try to reintroduce it. What do you think the same or? Well, uh, the thing is with it, there's, gluten is an interesting one. I've done a lot of research into gluten because it's been something that's been part of my journey a lot. Okay. Um, I would say it's probably not worth getting into the conversation now because I could probably <laughs> do um, podcasts on this. But what I would say is that it's a tricky one. It's very tricky. Um, what we do know is that there's a guy called Dr. Fasano, an Italian gastroenterologist who's done some amazing science around gluten. And he was at the forefront of a lot of the leaky gut kind of stuff before it got commercial. Mm -hmm. And um, what we do know is that the gliadin in gluten has the ability to cleave the, um, the what we call tight junctions apart in the gut lining. And so in the wrong person at the wrong time, if they've already got IBS or they've already got um, Crohn's or celiac, these people are going to have issues with gluten for sure. But the problem is, is that they might not feel it in the gut. That's the issue. Right. Um, but they might feel it as brain fog or joint pain. So the thing is, is that's why like it has to be tailored to someone very individually. And like you say, Oh yeah, gluten's the devil. Take it out for everybody. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's not. But there are people that it's a lot more of the devil for than someone else. Yeah. 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 Wow. <laughs> I think we've covered pretty much everything. But... No, no, no. We have been tough to start. Jillian's face from one side to the other. <laughs> <laughs> the I know. <laughs> I didn't I, think the song would come out. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Um, and some snow. <laughs> so. But guys, that's that's been absolutely amazing. Um, every bit of that. I'd love to have you on again. So.
if, if that tell us when and where we'll be there yeah <laughs> awesome yeah. Very easy. We love hearing. it's like the easiest thing for us to do yeah um, no but things that we have to julian has to ask you though before you go well, yeah, no, obviously for anyone out there that's listening and tuning in, you know, how, where can they find you? And if they want to find out what you're up to, where's the best place to contact you? Uh, the easiest point is if you just put Cliff Amata in Google, um, <laughs> like that's generally the easiest part. But like cliffamata.com is our website, but at Cliff Amata Wild is our Facebook page or at Cliff Amata for instagram instagram but our community our group on facebook is just we always say that we love bringing people together um and having an amazing conversation with them and that's the ara method group on facebook um that's where we hang out with our clients peeps. with the peeps i'm one of the peeps fantastic and my other question i like to ask all my guests so you know, the, the, the podcast is called The Fit and Fabulous Podcast, so a little F word. <laughs> and I always ask everyone, what's your favourite F word? Oh, my God. Fuck. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> like, I'm not even thinking about it. Well, <laughs> fabulous is pretty close. <laughs> or do you have one? Maybe people don't have one. <laughs> no, they're just trying to be yeah. good. I can see it on Chris' face. He's like, no, I can't say it. No. I can't. I just can't. It's, it's I... I literally lived for a filter for so many years of my life. Like, I just I can't do it anymore. You had your mouth washed out with soap once by your mother. Yeah, I did. No more. <laughs> yeah. Do you know what? I always say that because there is a, a belief that if someone swears and uses profanities, they don't have much to say. Mm. True. It's, it's, <laughs> it's true. It's true. It's <laughs> true. <laughs> so we can say that. The way I look at it, and again, circling back to something that we mentioned a lot earlier today, is the approach and the interpretation and the meaning. It is just a word. If mm -hmm. someone treats fuck as the wrong, bad, inappropriate word, what else do you treat as inappropriate, wrong, or bad that could possibly be stopping you from having the results you want? Because it will then tie into our stories, right? It's just a word that at some point we decided had a negative meaning. So it's, it's just an exploration. I'm not saying that everyone should go out there and just drop C-bombs and F-bombs all over the place. It's just asking yourself, really. Why? That sounds like a belief. <laughs> Each to their own, whatever people prefer. Oh, that is Honestly, is just an interpretation and to me it's not being angry it's it's passionate it's yeah. passion and it's like that underlying like to what we talk about that just, sometimes just comes out as fuck I just have it <laughs> when i like shout fudge <laughs> it's just not the same and but. you know I, as, a, as a teenager i had um one of the, the front men of a punk rock band that I used to love at that time. And they're still going. I don't know how old these guys are at the moment. But anyway, he said on a radio, um, in a radio interview, and someone asked him about swearing. And, you know, they said, why do you swear so much? And he said, look, if I'm fucked off with someone, I'm not going to say I'm cross. <laughs> I was like, yeah, exactly that. So, yeah, Could just... <laughs> Very cross <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's like you need to you need to get the emotion into it, and it just doesn't lend itself, does it? Really? So. Yeah. I, you know, each their own. Like I, I completely get it when people don't swear and stuff like that. It's I don't think there's a right or a wrong to it. Like yeah. I would honour it if someone says to me, you know, like if someone says to me, "Oh, you can't come on the podcast if you swear," I'm like, "Well, let's not do the podcast then," because it's just like. I can't guarantee that that ain't going to slip out. Yeah. See yeah. what I mean? Yeah. And I'll be, instead of thinking about the value I want to add to the podcast, I'll be thinking in my head, I can't be myself. Yeah. I have to avoid saying this thing, which takes away from the whole point of trying to serve people that are listening or watching, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah absolutely. absolutely. So, yeah. Okay. Nice. Well, cool. Thank you so much for coming on. Um, thank you for having us. Yeah, no, yeah. we'll have you any, any, any time you want to drop F bombs, we will have you. <laughs> <laughs> two hours, just let us know. <laughs> yeah. Let's see if you can try it. <laughs> <laughs>
Um, yeah. Thank you guys. Um, yeah, I'm sure Gillian has had an awesome time too. So yeah, thank you very much. Mm. And as soon as we get this, yeah, we'll get it out to you and share the love, share the love. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you so Thanks for your time, guys. All right. Appreciate it. See you later, guys. Thank you. Adios. Bye-bye.